This is a production of Cornell University Library. Good afternoon, everyone. My name is Sarah Wright, and I am Mann Library's Interim Director. I am so pleased to welcome such a large audience to today's Chats in the Stacks book talk, which we've aligned with Earth Day coming up later this month. Now, before we get started, I'll note that today's book talk will follow our usual format. So after our speakers have concluded the formal presentation portion of the program, we'll begin the Q&A. We invite audience members to, su to submit questions via the chat function of this Zoom webinar at any point in the program, and we'll do our best to present the questions in the order that they were received. For any audience members who might be interested in purchasing the book being featured today, I'll also take the opportunity to point out that Comstock Publishing Associates, mm -hmm. which is an imprint of Cornell University Press, has given us a promotional code to share with you that provides a discounted price for the book purchase. Uh, you'll notice the code on this slide that is currently visible on the screen. And now on with our book talk. Our featured book takes on an increasingly urgent topic, the impact of climate change on the food we eat. And today's speakers are the co-authors and the illustrator of this important work. Mike Hoffman is Cornell Professor Emeritus of Entomology and over his career at the university has held a number of leadership positions including Executive Director of the Cornell Institute for Climate Change Solutions, Director of the Cornell University Agricultural Experiment Station, Associate Dean of the College of Agricultural and Life Sciences, Associate Director of the Cornell Cooperative Extension, and Director of the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program. He presently dedicates all his time to the grand challenge of climate change, working hard to spread a science-based message about what is happening and what we can all do about it. His media have included popular press venues such as The Hill, Fortune Magazine, and USA Today, a well-received TEDx talk entitled Climate Change, It's Time to Raise Our Voices, and now also this new book, Our Changing Menu. As Dr. Hoffman puts it, melting glaciers are bad enough, but the loss of coffee is downright terrifying, which is a thought that keeps him going to tell the climate change story with humor, without doom and gloom, and yet with the passion and conviction needed to bring everyone along in addressing the most critical environmental challenge of our times. Co-author Carrie koplinka lohr has 25 years of experience communicating about agricultural issues and how they intersect with the environment. She has directed the Northeastern Integrated Pest Management Center at Cornell University for a decade and the communications team for the New York State Integrated Pest Management Program in Geneva, New York. As a freelancer, she has written for Yes Magazine, Sierra Magazine, and Scopes Magazine. Carrie has an MS in Science Education from Cornell University and is a member of the Society of Environmental Journalists and the National Association of Science Writers. Our third speaker is Danielle Eisman, visiting lecturer in the Department of Communication where she teaches risk communication, science communication and writing, and environmental communication. As a researcher, Dr. Eisman's work examines climate change communication strategies with a particular focus on encouraging pro-environmental behavior change. She collaborates on research for the Center for Conservation Social Sciences and the Emergent Climate Risk Lab at Cornell University. She's been a program manager at the Cornell Institute for Climate Smart Solutions and has served as an advisor to the Government of Scotland on engaging the public in climate change policies. Dr. Eisman holds a PhD in marketing from Harriet Watt University in Edinburgh, Scotland, a master's in carbon management from the University of Edinburgh, a master's in marketing and economics from DePaul University, as well as a degree in culinary arts from the Scottsdale Culinary Institute. And finally, our fourth speaker is illustrator Lindsay Hodaf, who is currently a junior at Cornell University studying fine arts. Our Changing Menu is the second book she has illustrated. Aside from illustration, Lindsay practices intaglio printmaking and game design. And we are very grateful for her willingness to give us some of her precious time today, despite the hectic crunch that every Cornell student faces in these late semester weeks. And with that, please join me in welcoming our speakers as they share their thoughts about their work and the perspective it bears on the problem of climate change that we face on our planet and for our global community today. Thank you, Sarah. We are thrilled to be here today. 
to share this story of our book, Our Changing Menu, Climate Change and the Foods We Love and Need. What's really special is today is the official release date by Cornell University Press of the book. And I think stating it pretty simply, if you eat, we think you will appreciate this story. And we're each going to provide our perspectives on the book by responding to the question, why this book? Next slide, please. So this is, I'll start, and the three others will do the same thing. So why this book? I've been in working in the climate change space for quite some time. And I've probably given over 120 talks about climate change using a variety of means to get the attention of the audience. And you have to overcome what's called psychological distance. Uh, audiences don't care about things necessarily that are gonna happen in the year 2100 or melting glaciers in Greenland. It has to be relevant. And whenever I brought up food, clearly the interest from the audience was piqued. We all eat and we all drink and making that connection makes climate change relevant. And you've already heard this quote, but it applies to me too. The loss of coffee is downright terrifying. And since most of us love this beverage, it is a concern and it gets people's attention. The other thing that's really unique about this approach is the number of stories are essentially unlimited. If you're at a dinner, you look down at your plate, look at the menu, there are stories throughout. And they're interesting, they're not necessarily doom and gloom, but they're interesting stories and a way to tell, uh, share a message about climate change. Given the nature of this topic, how big it is, how, how complicated, it seemed like a team effort was essential. So Carrie and Danielle joined on and Lindsay as well. Hi, everyone, and thanks for attending. Uh, since I was a child, I felt a deep connection to the earth. And to this day, I'm, I'm pained by humans' relationship to it. About 10 years ago, my husband and I bought the solar home that Cornell students and staff built for a national competition. And we moved it 12 miles north of Ithaca, and we started living off the grid. Here I am in 2010, standing on the roof and scraping ice off of 72 photovoltaic panels so we can turn the lights on. And half an hour into it, I'm thinking, most people aren't gonna do this to save the planet. Which begs the questions, what is a sustainable way for us to live? And how can we move forward? Those are two of the questions that I was asking when Mike invited me to co-author this book, and the project has been a great way to explore answers. Hi, everyone. I'm Danielle Eisman, and for me to be invited to work on this book with Mike and Carrie was a wonderful opportunity for me to blend all of my, my past lives together in a cohesive body of work. So I, I feel as though most of my life has been rather fragmented. I, I have a background in chemistry and biochemistry, and then I moved to cooking and then marketing and economics and carbon management and consumer behavior. And I've always had this passion or interest in environmental issues. And so I've finally, you know, by working with Mike and Carrie, I've had this opportunity to take all of the things that I've learned and all the experiences that I've had and, and you know, share them with, with Mike and Carrie and share them in the book, but to also share them with, with so many people and, and also to take my, you know, my love and passion for food, as well as um, use it as a tool for communicating about climate change, which is an issue that I've been concerned with for such a long time, has been such a unique opportunity. And given that it's Throwback Thursday, uh, I thought I'd throw in a, a classic picture of me cooking um, in my former chef's whites. Um, and then I want to introduce you to 
Lindsay. So um, Lindsay, our illustrator, um, we, we sent out a call for artists to contribute to the book. And Lindsay came to my office and I was the first one to meet her. And I had the chance to sit down and tell her about the concept and what we were looking for. And she said, you know what? Let me just ma make a drawing for you. So she left and she came back a couple of days later and she, she brought this image of wheat. And I was blown away. I thought, oh my gosh, this is exactly what we were looking for. And I ran down the hall to Mike's office and I said, you have to see this. This is the person that we were looking for. So we, we brought Lindsay on and, and her work has been amazing. So, Hi, so I'm Lindsay. Um, so I'll say in line with that story, I was just as excited and enthusiastic to be chosen for this um, project. I have my background in art is doing many different things um, from illustration to printmaking and also um, work for video games um, with other students on campus. Um, and for this, for me, uh, I really saw it as, um, you know, a lot of uh, people my age or students um, are very interested in climate change. And there's often a feeling of like, well, what can you do? Like being so young and so, um, you know, just one person. Um, and for me, I really saw this as, you know, I got to do something that I loved, which is make artwork um, and also uh, could do something that had impact. And so for me, this was like my very tiny piece of like, you know, the smallest thing I could do for this enormous issue with our planet. Um, and yeah, just improve like um, communication through that and make like all this, all these complicated things and like text and everything more accessible through images. So yeah. So why climate change? It's one of the grandest challenges we currently face. Why food? I think we've made that connection pretty simply. We all eat and we can tell a story about climate change through that food. Next slide. So here's the story, essentially the organization of the book. First, the audience. The audience is primarily the US and also, as well as developed countries because in particular the US is the greatest contributor to climate change in the world. And when you look at it cumulatively, and we also have the capacity to make a difference. So we focused on that audience. We wanted to make sure the story was based on science and we did our best to find the literature that was appropriate, the government reports, you name it. And we have over 700 citations in the book to back up our story. We also sent various portions of the book to over 60 experts for their comments. And there's also no villains in this story. We're not pointing fingers at someone else along the food chain. We're all in this together. We all eat. So the book is organized with a start with a discussion of the global food system, which is extremely complex. If you think about what just happened in the Suez Canal, well, on the horizon, there are choke points in the food system around the world. Some of those will be uh, become worse with climate change, social disruptions, etc. But it's an amazing system and how we get our chocolate from Western Africa, vanilla from Madagascar. So that sets the stage. Then we cover what's climate change, the cause, the impacts, the future, how do models work, all written in a way that anybody can understand the message and understand what's happening to our climate. And what about a plant, the basis of life? Its world depends on the right temperature, soil, water, and air. All of those are changing. And we discussed that. And then the menu, which is the heart of the story, start with a good drink and with desserts and coffee. And we discuss what's happening along the entire, throughout the entire menu. And anytime you talk about climate change, you have to include solutions. And we end with that. And Carrie, offers her series of interviews throughout the book that bring to life what's happening on the front lines with people and how they're facing dealing with climate change. So let's just look at one thing that's happening to a plant. 
increasing carbon dioxide. Well, a lot of people claim that that's great. That's beneficial to most crops, but the consensus is that will be offset by higher temperatures and water stress. Weeds will actually become harder to control in the future with herbicides with rising CO2 levels. Human nutrition, but mid-century, our major crops will have less protein, vitamins, minerals, and in particular in rice, vitamin B will drop by 30%. And there's all kinds of cool things. Well, that's one way to say it. That happens to our vegetables. Flavors change, colors change. And since I'm not a fond, uh, I'm not fond of kale, actually it will become sweeter and maybe I will like it in the future. Next slide. The heart of the story, the menu. We start with drinks, salads, mains, sides, desserts, coffee. And this book is not doom and gloom. It tells a scary story, but it is a celebration of food. Danielle wrote a sidebar on cheese. So cheese is used in desserts. And I just about had to go to Wegmans to buy cheese. It was so delightful just to think about. The cold beer at the end of the day. And then, so it's, we're celebrating food. Where's it come from? Think about the family in Western Africa making $4 a day to get the cacao that we need for our chocolate. It comes from all over the world. Who cares? Those on the ground growing our food care, it's our life. If you're a farmer, you're dependent on those crops to make a living. But we also include the economic impact of the food system, the jobs for those who may not focus on environmental issues, but are more concerned about the economic side of the story. And it's all changing. For each of the drinks, salads, mains, et cetera, we talk about change. There's a great Belgian beer that needs a cold winter. Well, winters are getting warmer, so it's being compromised. Olive oil, most of which comes from Spain, it's getting a lot hotter and drier there. So again, we go through each of the components of the meal and talk about what's changing. And then for each, what can be done? What's already being done by the farmers, the scientists for improving rice varieties. Um, there's a group in the UK and a group in Costa Rica joining forces to make sure we still have cacao. And then we wrap up with what we can all do. Look at a menu. It took me in 10 minutes, I found 26 ingredients on here that are changing. Fruit, for example, winters are warming. That has consequences on the yields of crop the next year. If it's too warm, like peaches in Georgia in 2017, there weren't any peaches because the previous winter was too warm. Seafood, major changes there. There's kale on here. We know that's going to get better tasting. Anyway, the point is the next time you look at a meal or grab a menu, you can find many things that are undergoing change. I mentioned we wrap up the story with solutions and hope. And we focus on the stewards of the land, farmers. They're doing their best they can with the current economic conditions. Most farmers today actually have to have a second income to stay on the land and that's in the US. It's a, it's a profession that is a tough one, but they're looking at improving soils, cover crops, better management of waste materials. A lot of progress is being made. Much more needs to occur, but progress is being made. Scientists developing new crop varieties. We saw the book as an incredible opportunity to convey the message of the value of science and connect that to food. You want a better pistachio? You want a pistachio in the future? That's where science is gonna come in. We also share the progress being made by food businesses. One of the chocolate companies has committed five, uh, $1 billion to its business. And that includes those growing the cacao in all around the world. There are other examples of food businesses doing a really good job of reducing their energy consumption. And even the beverage industry is reducing the weight of their glass bottles. These are all contributing to the greater cause of helping with climate change. And solutions, what we can all do. This is Greta Thunberg, all of 105 pounds. When someone says, what can I do? I point to Greta. We can't all be heroes, but her voice carries a lot of weight. 
First, we can become climate change literate. We can understand what's going on, what's causing climate change, the impacts, what it looks like in the future. So in the end, we can make informed decisions when it comes to climate change. We need to talk about it. In the US, two thirds of the people never talk about it. The book offers ideas on how to have that difficult conversation. When it comes to plant-based diet, we aren't suggesting stop eating red meat and rather consider it a delicacy and not a staple. You can still let occasion, enjoy that occasional hamburger, but it's not a staple. And it's not just food. We need to all assess our carbon footprint. Do we need to travel so much? The heat and cool our houses so that we're cozy all the time. And do we need to buy all of those things? So it's good for all of us to check out our own carbon footprint and what how we're contributing to climate change. And we really think it's important to appreciate those who supply the menu. Most of us just go to the grocery store and get our food, but there's a lot of people involved in getting it there, starting with farmers. In the US, out of 75 employed people, one is a farmer. A few feed many. And get involved. We offer ideas on how we can all get involved. It's a politicized issue, so maybe it's time we get political. Talk about it, raise our voices. So there's a lot that we can all do. I'm really fascinated by people. And I like to learn how they make a living, what they think, and then put that into words. I had suggested to Danielle and Mike that we put a human face on climate change by interviewing representatives from the food system. For example, farmers, food processing managers, chefs, uh, scientists who are coming up with solutions. Just a slice of the many people who bring the food to our tables. So essentially we, we did just that. Um, we focused on people who produce our food and how they're affected and adapting. And we also looked at the foods most imperiled. Um, we tried to balance professions and genders, have a geographical spread, uh, a compelling story, and most of all, we needed willing interviewees. Now, how do we find those folks? Uh, well, uh, the authors had quite a few contacts from conferences and a lifetime of being involved in this field. Uh, cooperative Extension was helpful to us. Um, a lot of us have roots in Cooperative Extension and uh, it's a national network. So they're able to identify farmers um, who are willing to speak to those who are writing books. We read newspaper articles and I contacted cooperatives and associations such as the Maine Lobster Marketing Collaborative. Uh, so we found people. And I focused on two lengths. One was very short sidebar of just 100 words. And the second was a medium sidebar of about 700 words that would take up one page. And that gave us some flexibility in how we used the interview material. Here's Colton Weinstein, um, who actually grew up in Ithaca. And he's uh, doing a sampling. He's based at the point of this photograph in Nashville, Tennessee. Um, so we, we asked most of the people that I interviewed a core set of questions. Uh, first of all, is, the climate, is climate change affecting you personally? Um, how about your industry? Is it nationally or globally? Um, is climate change altering the decisions that you make? And if so, how is it doing that? Um, what changes might you make in the future? And to be fair, do you see any opportunities? And actually people did. And here are the people we profiled. And you can see that there are four uh, from different countries. Uh, I interviewed folks from nine different states in Washington, DC, um, and everyone from sheep farmer to an oyster woman, uh, to growers of fruits and vegetables, um, some as local as New York and some quite far away. I wanted to 
share a little bit of the book with you by reading just a portion of an interview um, with someone named Tylan Morkel. He is um, a PhD candidate at the City University of New York. And in this photograph, he's in Arizona at his field station, washing um, rhizome from a hop plant and hops are used in beer production. So this piece is called Hunting Hops to Protect Them. In the Sky Islands, a teardrop shaped region where Arizona, New Mexico, and Mexico touch, Tylan Merkel moves among rocky fields looking for wild hops. The mountains here rise above the desert like islands in an ocean. Plants and animals thrive on these cool, moist slopes, but cannot survive in the dry heat below. Morkel and other scientists are cataloging Sky Island hop plants, determining whether they differ from one another genetically and chemically. He and his colleagues hope to eventually breed varieties that resist diseases and withstand drought, heat, and other climate-related stresses. The area's wild hops they have very high genetic diversity, but climate change and human encroachment threaten the habitat, says Morkel. There's a pressing need to characterize these hops while they're still there. So he hunts hops. Hi, so I'll be talking a little bit about my artwork. Um, so first I'll start with the process. Um, it was very significant for this book to start with pencil sketches and then I would send those to the authors and they would be reviewed and then returned to me. And um, usually based on the complication of the piece, some would take many iterations. I know, um, I remember during the summer of 2019, I was um, drawing an illustration of the process of anaerobic digestion, which at the time I didn't even know what that was. And uh, I think it probably took eight or more iterations of sending it back and forth. And I just didn't even want to draw it anymore. But um, but that, that when you get to the final product, it's exactly what you wanted. See, like a very huge thing about art is um, communication. It's what can you give your audience. And a lot of times for art, um, it's what feeling can you give. And for the illustrations I did for this book, it's what information you can give. Um, so a big part of that is redrawing um, data as visuals that are interesting and engaging for your audience. So um, the, this graph is an illustration of sources of greenhouse gases in the US. Um, and one thing I tried to put into these images was that each part of it is something interesting that audiences can see and like easily visualize. So it's not just, um, you know, looking at a graph and then, you know, it's so distant from you. Um, like we were talking earlier in the presentation about making things relevant. Well, art makes things relevant and being able to see it and see how it impacts your life also makes it relevant. Um, yeah, and so here are a couple more examples of um, some graphs I did. So um, the one on the left is land needed to produce um, different proteins um, and like land use required. And um, the one on the right is a visual representation of why we drink coffee. Um, that was also actually a really early um, illustration I had done for this. Um, so yeah. Lindsay, if I can just add to that, the mm -hmm. I was impre so impressed because I did send you a very, very boring bar, bar graph of why people drink coffee. And this is what came back. It was um, just perfect, very intuitive. Uh, pleasant to the eye. And, and likewise, the apple, that was the first image, actually is a demonstration of the thin layer, the troposphere that we live in. And that's where climate change is happening. So your talents were put to wonderful use. As we were writing this book, we were sometimes finding dozens of new scientific papers a week about the relationship between climate change and food. We knew we needed help in managing all of that information. Uh, so I actually contacted a reference librarian at Mann Library. She sat down with me in person and taught me how to create an online group library with a program called Zotero. 
And that's what we used. We started cataloging information for a chart of foods and how they are affected by climate change. We quickly realized that we couldn't keep this kind of table up to date in a book. Uh, a website turned out to be a much better option and would also allow us to promote the book and other ideas. So I applied for and received a Podell Award for research and scholarship and was able to hire two students and it was a big job. Uh, but Jess Bry built the original website and Marta Faulkner um, built the original database. And then many students have helped uh, bring it from there and Mike's gonna tell you about that. Yes, the website is an excellent way to, we, we essentially consider the website a living version of the book. Um, there is so much happening to the food uh, that we enjoy around the world. And we thought this database, what we call a food ingredient database, but we one way to share that with the visitors. And if you just look down uh, right now, I think it has maybe 80 entries, but we have three, two students working on this. And I can see hundreds of ingredients being here in the future. Um, if we just look at anchovies and global, yes, but their populations are moving as the oceans change. Apples are subject to hailstorms or what are called false springs. So one can enter a food ingredient and just simply find uh, what's changing to an ingredient or a food. This could be, this database could be very informative for all of us, just if we care about food uh, of interest to chefs, restaurant owners, retailers, et cetera. There's nothing like this out there. In fact, there's nothing like our book or website out there currently that is a comprehensive assessment of what climate change means to our food. So as we were doing the literature reviews for what's happening to these um, food ingredients, it dawned on me that what about other plant-based products like perfume? Perfume is actually having a lot of impacts, especially on the flower growers in France. What about pet food? Well, if the nutritional quality of grains is going to change, grains are used in pet food. Medicinal herbs, pharmaceuticals, dyes. So there's another website that will focus on plant-based products that I think everyone will find extremely interesting um, because a lot of change is occurring there in these multi-billion dollar industries. Hi everyone, uh, Danielle again. So, um, you know, our changing menu is more than than just a book and more than just the website that you just saw. Um, so we do have the, the book that's out today, our changing menu, climate change and the foods we love and need, as well as the companion website that provides up to date information on what's changing, as well as the food and plant based product databases. Uh, but also we have a very active social media um, account. So we were on Twitter and Instagram at the moment um, at our changing menu. Thanks to the um, tire tireless efforts of uh, my marketing team, um, Christina Pinheiro and Natalie Bronfen, who are amazing and have been amazing help as amazing help throughout this process. Uh, we're also working on research with other colleagues, uh, trying to develop some messaging studies to explore whether or not messages about food and climate change will spur people into action and will actually get them to uh, take more action in their daily lives, uh, as well as getting out and, and voting for politicians that will help build policies that will protect food and protect farmers. Um, and also we are working on more ways to engage. So we're working on a, a web series with a comedian, um, a friend of mine and former coworker from the culinary industry who is also a stand-up comedian. So he's been interviewing some uh, people along the, the supply chain to talk about how they're experiencing climate change. Uh, we're also looking into art. We'd love to promote Lindsay's art because we think that as you've seen several of her images throughout 
this presentation. We really are excited and, and love her artwork. And it looks really great up on your wall. Uh, so I have a few <laughs> pictures of that. <laughs> Um, and then also looking at ways that we could use music, uh, as well as film to extend this message. Plus, um, Mike and I, who really just do not enjoy working together, we have, a, have put together an eCornell course. So um, if you're really interested in learning how to use, um, you know, how climate impacts food, we have that course available through eCornell. Um, oops. Oops, mouse went wild there. Um, but also, you know, we want to leave you with this thought that, you know, we hopefully, you know, we hope you'll buy the book and visit the website to become informed and, and to learn more about climate change and its relationship to the foods that we love and need. Uh, but we also want to emphasize that we all have a role in this fight against climate change, that you should, you know, raise your voice, talk to people about it, um, you know, most of us eat three meals a day, and a lot of those times we are sharing a meal with other people. So that's the perfect time to raise your voice and talk about food and climate change. Um, but also recognize that there's no way to be perfect, or you don't have to be perfect about trying to do your part in fighting against climate change. So do what you're best at. If you are great at talking, talk your friend's ear off about climate change. If you are great at writing, write something about climate change. Um, you know, they, like I said, just do what you're best at. Um, and also we're trying to create a social movement through our various activities. So help us share your experiences, share your stories, share your images through our different social media channels because we'd love to hear how you are experiencing climate change through food. And lastly, find a greater purpose. Get out there, vote, talk to people, share your stories. Um, and lastly, we, we wouldn't want to forget anybody because, um, you know, as I've seen people mention, this has been a, a very collaborative project, not just um, you know, not just the, the four of us, but also the, the people that took the time to review the technical aspects of the book and, and Cornell University Press that, um, you know, guided us through this process, but also the, the students that have been involved and have supported us throughout this process, either by researching things or writing things. Um, and helping build the website. So Jess Bray is a graduate student that graduated in 20. Marta Faulkner, she has been with me for years working on my climate change podcast. Um, and she is amazing and is going on to Princeton. Um, Maeve Anderson, from, who graduated in 2019. Kalina Bonnier-Saron. Um, Natalie Bronfen, who's part of my marketing team, Nancy Engel from 20, uh, Victoria Eshon, who is working very closely with Marta to uh, help build the website and make it run fast and um, you know, make it so it, it works very well and does all the technical things that none of us know how to do on the, the author team. Uh, Brandon Garcia, who's one of my former students and he is working on the food database. Bjorn Kroos, he's um, taken a bunch of my classes and is in one of my classes now, and he's working on the plant-based database. Samita Pendel, she's taken several of my courses as well, and she's working on the food database. And Christina Pinheiro, who is the other part of my amazing marketing team. And of course, uh, we would not be able to get as far as we've come without the um, generous support from the Towards Sustainability Foundation and the Podell Emeriti Awards for Research and Scholarship Program. Thank you. All right. All right. Well, thank you so very much, uh, Danielle, Mike, Carrie, Lindsay. That was just great. So important. And I'm so grateful that we're getting to hear, um, hear about this today. It's, uh, it's, it's, it is very thought provoking. 
Um, I, my name is Evelyn Ferretti, and I am the Public Programs um, Administrator at Mann Library. And um, I'm here. I've joined in to um, pose the questions that have come in. There have been a few questions that come in, have come in via the chat. I will pose them in the order received. Um, if you have, I encourage you to continue to pose some questions. I think we have a bit of time, so I think we we can handle a few more, a number more. If, if you have questions for particular panelists, just go ahead and put that in the in the chat. And I'll, um, I'll, I'll, I'll make sure that gets specified. Um, so for now, I'm going to go ahead and start with the first ones that have come in. This question is from Sydney. Our family used to love eating seafood. We do not eat meat, but after watching Sea Spiracy, we've heard a lot about that movie in recent days, we cannot eat fish. I am very concerned even about our local grocery stores like Wegmans. What is the future of fish as a source of protein without hurting the planet and people? What should we do about our local stores? So that's to any of you. Let me, let me try with that one. Uh, just to bear in mind that aquaculture is expanding rapidly and is providing a fairly large portion of our fish supply today that comes with its own set of environmental issues and has to be done correctly, uh, such as taking out the mangroves in, in, in Vietnam, but actually growing seafood and shrimp, et cetera, within the mangrove and a more ecologically sensitive approach. Um, the concerning part about seafood is that the basis of the food chain, phytoplankton, the tiny little plants that float around are starting to be stressed um, because of warming oceans. And without that basis to the food chain, that obviously affects everything all the way up to the top of the food chain and the fish and other seafood that we consume. I can't comment on, I'm not going to comment on the report that was mentioned I'm, I'm, or the, the article. I'm not familiar enough with it, but I think for seafood, much improved management of how it's harvested globally would help. And bottom line, stop releasing greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. That's so there's very global approaches to conserving and preserving the seafood that we enjoy and depend on. I'll just add to that. Um, one of the people with whom I spoke for the book was someone named Kyle Foley, and she is with the Gulf of Maine Research Institute, um, heads up seafood sustainability program. And the two messages that really came through after speaking with Kyle were, shift what you eat. So for example, as populations of fish change, we can't keep staying with populations that are depleted. We need to change what we eat. And the second <laughs> is that make the connection between the people who are doing the fishing and the buyers. Uh, so she gave examples of what's happening um, with different food corporations that supply universities in Maine and said that they're gradually coaxing along the students in Maine to eat different types of fish based on what's available. Uh, and she felt like that was a big step towards sustainability. All right, thank you. This is a um, somewhat related question, uh, partly because I think there's so many connections with changing climate, um, but it is a specific question too. And it's, um, this one's from Lisa. Could you please give us an update on bee colony collapse, possibly, and its and its um, and the um, and the connections with climate change? What are the causes? What are possible solutions? Um, any insights? Thank you. Well, there's several reasons for uh, bee colony collapse. We're suspicious of a particular pesticide. Uh, a huge one is loss of habitat. There are some diseases that are popping up on occasion. Um, so there's there's multiple factors affecting sort of the viability of our of our bee populations. Uh, but I think when it comes to climate change, one of the biggest ones would be uh, you know habitat destruction, and then the stress added to that of of climate change, uh, higher temperatures, more heavy precipitation, um, and those sort of things. Uh, the future, again, back to habitat, 
we need to do everything we can to maintain and increase the habitat that our bee populations need. All right, thank you. Next question is from Benita. Uh, sorry, it's actually more of a comment from Benita saying how much she loved this book and, and how it came through, uh, through how the collaboration, the collaboration behind it. Um, Maria asked this question, what would you say is the most hopelessly endangered food at this moment? We're thinking. <laughs> I think it depends on your perspective and which food you would miss the most, but also, you know, there's, there are people working to prevent anything from being hopelessly lost. If I can just pick up on that. Um, because there was a paper out recently about all of the wild types of coffee being lost because they grow in little niches that are just, um, you know, just for a particular type of wild coffee and those are being lost. Um, but again, with the right resources and the investments and maintaining those wild types, I think coffee will be okay. But that's the one that makes me nervous. And, and to build on that a little bit, uh, I, I would say one of the things that uh, seems quite perilous to me uh, would be the crops that are dependent on glacial melt. And as those glaciers melt and they're not around anymore, um, all those crops are going to be threatened because they're currently irrigated um, with ice water. And so you know, crops like Avocados, for example, uh, could be quite endangered. Let me take that a little further. That, thank you, Carrie. Um, just an example, if I did not mention it, we get about half a million dollars of blueberries from Peru every year, typically during our winter. And exactly as Carrie described, they are dependent on meltwater from an ice cap, but that could be gone in as little as 20 years. And on a much grander scale, although there's an enormous amount of ice in the Himalayas, as they melt, those waters will decline and the impact on the, on the vast plains below and all the people that depend on that water, that's a pretty genuine concern at a grand scale. All right, thank you. I'm gonna move on to the next question. It's, it was comment, but I'm gonna turn it into a question. Is there, Might you consider um, in the database that's on the uh, online, um, might you consider um, including a ranking of the foods of the um, impact that the cultivation of different foods makes on climate change? So in other words, to help inform consumers, you know, how perhaps to avoid certain foods because it's a higher, higher impact, higher negative impact. Um, consumption. Great idea. Danielle. <laughs> we just had a discussion about this yesterday. Um, yeah, we, um, we were speaking to a, a, a chef yesterday and, and that question came up. And so, it, you know, I'd like to, I guess it, adding to my list of summer projects is, is to possibly create a, a chef's corner, but, and where people can, can get that information where, you know, it, and it's not necessarily a ranking so much, but, you know, because the, the food system is so complicated and it does come down to what farming practices are used and, what are the energy inputs that go into that and how far does the food have to travel and the energy that's associated with that. So it, it, it can get complicated quite quickly, but yes, we think it would be great to have a space on the website that informs people on, on what could be most helpful to understand which, which foods would be um, you know, of the lowest impact if you wanted to eat that way, um, as well as, we want to create a, a community where people share their ideas on that as well, or things that they have tried. So, you know, I guess it's it's in the works. All right, thank you, Danielle. Um, 
Next question is from Cyrus, and I apologize if I'm not pronouncing that properly, Cyrus. Um, there was a plot, and this re this uh, refers to the, um, I think it's your graph, uh, one of your illustrations, Lindsay. There was a plot of climate, there was a, a, a graph, an illustration of climate impacts of various foods, and beef was the largest. Is this, uh, does this convey the total impact or the impact per, um, per pound of food? Uh, for that graph, it was expressing the resources required to um, produce that food. So the um, proportions were deliberately like that so that um, it would show that animals produced or they required way more land space than um, let's say pulses or other like um, vegetables. And it's per unit of protein. So comparing a unit of protein of you know, the grain, for example, as opposed to the beef. Okay, great, thank you. Um, this question is from Giorgio. Should we consume farm-raised fish or wild-caught fish? There are pros and cons for both. What would you recommend? Do you have any easy recommendations? I think the, if I can answer, attempt at that answer, um, if it's farm raised in a manner that is as you know environmentally sensitive as possible, uh, let me put it this way, that may be the choice we have in the future. Um, again, the story about fish and harvest from the seas is complicated. So I'm just gonna stop there and say that, um, I, I honestly, maybe this is one of those questions we can consider and give it a little more thought and respond a little more adequately. Um, just a twist to that story is in the future, we may actually be eating more squid and octopi, octopus because they love the new warm conditions. So there may be another thing on our plate far, far more common than uh, in the future than today than fish. I'll just add that uh, that one of the people I interviewed was um, actually a, a friend of Danielle's, a chef named Andre Padilla, and he's based in Chicago. Um, he told me that it's really difficult with wild caught fish to be able to trace the supply chain adequately. And that really bothers him because he's looking for sustainability in the foods that he serves in the restaurant. And so he said that has changed his attitude um, toward farm-raised fish because with the farm-raised, he can tell exactly where it comes from. He, he knows so much more about it. I thought that was very interesting. All right, thank you. So the questions are kind of coming in fast and furious. Now we may not get to all of them, um, but I believe we all of us have a few, few some extra time so we can go past five o'clock, um, although I might have to wrap up a little ahead of time. I mean, not ahead of time, but I might have, we might not get to all of them. So I'll, we'll try to get to as many as we can and, and, um, and yeah, we'll see how far we get. Um, in any case, so next question is uh, from Mark, Mark, Mark Sharvery. Um, individual behavior change may not be enough. How do you think the food industry will change and adjust what they offer to be more sustainable and climate change friendly? Well, These questions are very challenging. <laughs> Go ahead, Danielle. They're good. They're excellent questions. I, I agree wholeheartedly with you, Mark. Um, there's, a, there's already a lot happening within the food industry. People that are working with food, you know, they, they see it every single day. So they are aware of it and they are making great strides, especially if you you are part of these, um, you know, climate smart farming groups, uh, such as the, the North American, um, I forget the acronym, uh, you know, we love acronyms in this world, but uh, <laughs> so, you know, there's a, a group dedicated um, to climate smart agriculture in North America, but also globally. And so the, it's, you know, thousands of, of farmers around the world that are 
taking great strides to make sure that the food that they produced is produced in a way that has minimal impact on the environment because it just makes better management sense for them you know taking practices such as no-till and um, reducing the amount of inputs that they need as far as like fertilizer nutrients so they are working on these things to improve their productivity so they can stay in business and i'll give another example but the, say the wine industry out west has formed an alliance that's focused on climate change staying in business but also doing their part you know to be a good global citizen so there is progress being made in the food industry. All right, thank you. Um, next question is, is from uh, James. Um, Jim, how can we close the nutrient cycle in our food systems? For example, food filled with nutrients are shipped off the field, consumed in another location, and the nutrients go down the toilet. Can growing food be sustainable without turning these nutrients back to the land it came from? I guess just, have, go ahead. I was just going to say, we do have a pretty um, big section of uh, dairy, and we address anaerobic digestion. And, uh, you know, that's been in its infancy in the US uh, because of the relatively low uh, price of um, carbon based fuels. Um, but that process uh, can lead to the possibility of having electricity and also uh, fertilizer for fields. And it is uh, possible in the future that we might see um, more connections like they're doing in California between farms and municipalities um, where all of that waste um, is recycled. But it has been, it has been slow. All right. Um... Continuing on. I don't know if you wanted to add. Did you want to add to that, Mike? You... All right, Mike. Next question here is, um, what do you think the role of human population growth is in climate change, stress on food resources, et cetera? I've been asked this question about 120 times, given every talk that comes up. There's a lot of people, some argue that if we produce the food in a sort of ecologically based means, we could actually feed that population. But given all the political and social stresses, et cetera, uh, I think we face an extraordinary challenge to continue to do that. Um, one of the positive things in Drawdown, which is a publication or a group list where we could really make huge advances in climate change by simply reduce, reducing the amount of emissions. And one of those, this is globally, was to educate young women who then could be more successful in a business or farm, et cetera. But the outcome of that is uh, the birth rate goes down. And it's fairly high on their list as a way to grapple with climate change. Thank you, Mike. Um, this is from Jake Brenner. Hi, Mike and Danielle. His question from Jake Brenner. <laughs> How optimistic are you that agricultural tech advances, GMOs, sustainable intensification, et cetera, will mitigate the impacts of climate change on food supply chain, chains, the, the ones that you identified as high risk? Everything Barry? is happening, <laughs> Danielle. Um, go ahead. No, I'll I let you said. go first. No, no, I was just, I just was joking around. I, I said very optimistic. Anyway, go, <laughs> go ahead. If, if we have the will, uh, political, social, moral will, whatever, to, to make the changes we need, we'll succeed. I mean, we face a really difficult challenge and climate change is not going away. It's going to continue no matter what we do so we can adapt. Um, but when I look around and even the experiences we had in writing the book and learning about all the tens of thousands of people around the world trying to do the right thing and keep that menu stocked, um, I have some optimism. I mean, there's still vast challenges out there, but I think if we can, and that's frankly, the social movement we're talking about, can we raise climate change as awareness and action using food? 
but then addressing it in every way possible, um, that's our hope. So maybe I'm not real optimistic, but I'm certainly hopeful that we can make this happen. All right, I think we have uh, time for just a couple of more questions. So we have a lot more than we have time for. Um, and uh, sorry that we can't get to everybody's. Um, but I will a, a copy of your, your questions are being are, uh, will be turned over to the to the uh, speakers. So um, to our speakers, so they will hear your um, they will hear your questions in any case. Um, the next question is from Tom. What do you see the role of urban agriculture in this mix? Vertical vertical farms, rooftop farms, etc. Well, let me just respond to vertical farms, roof, uh, vertical farms in particular. The literature says to date that they're still quite energy intensive. Um, and the current production is often on you know, specialty crops that are really high value. And um, so that one has some technology challenges yet because the greenhouse gas footprint from that production is still high. Um, I'll turn to Carrie when it comes to the urban garden component. <laughs> oh, thanks. <laughs> I think there's potential. Uh, what we've I've seen so far is that uh, tends to be much smaller production. You just don't have the acreage right now. Um, one of the chefs I spoke to um, did have a rooftop farm and said that there. Uh, tomatoes for their salsa came from that and um, he's very proud of that because it was really local it was like on top of the restaurant um, so it's happening and I think there's enthusiasm uh, and I've seen some very exciting examples um, awful lot of people to feed and we need an awful lot of food for that all right thank you um, this question relates to one of the um, impacts of, of, um, of changing food systems. What, how do you anticipate changing food systems to impact migration within, within and between countries near and long-term? And this is a question from Kimberly Anderson who says, hi. Well, there was a report not that long ago of human migration as well as changes in crop production in the U.S. in ProPublica. And the story was a little uh, uh, grim. Uh, they depict the changes, I hope I'm answering the question, uh, of North America and how the area that basically they use an index called livability, you know, where it's most reasonable to live for humans will move north relatively soon. Let's say in the next, I think the time scale was 2040 to 2060 when some of the shifts were going to occur. And then they also did the same for three major crops. But when you look at those uh, images, it's quite striking and how quickly uh, migration, you know, it's not that far off in the future is going to occur. And that's just in the US. Um, I mean, in the press right now, there are people leaving Central America in part because of climate change and food disruption. So that's, that's a tough challenge on the horizon. Sorry, excuse me. Next question is from Joshua. Um, is animal-based agriculture the largest form of agriculture in the U.S.? If so, how does an appeal to, to moving to a plant-based diet impact long-term agriculture in the U.S.? If people's diet needs to, if, if people's diets needs do change, then does this also mean that the look and makeup of U.S. agriculture has to change as well? Danielle, you had some thoughts on that the other day. Um, I'm trying to remember. Um, <laughs> well, I mean, I can start and you can come in. Um, I'm not sure if it is the largest. Well, let me, let me qualify that right away. A great deal of land in the U.S. is used for grazing or production of food for animals. It's a high proportion. It's actually quite stunning. I don't know the percentage right now. So I guess if you look at it in that way, then you know from a landscape level, 
it is one of the having the largest impact um, as an agricultural industry. A transition to more plant-based obviously uh, means a huge change in uh, you know, even production of certain crops, because in the Midwest, a lot of corn is grown and soy, especially for cattle feed, that has to change. Could it change? Yes. Um, I guess it's just like any other major industry that needs to change because of climate change, whether it's coal mining, whatever. So um, if we have the will, that's possible. And we actually specifically call this out in the book in a sidebar something to the effect of tough choices because making that transition will impact the lives of tens of thousands of people who currently produce those animals that many of us consume. So we, I think we have to be sensitive to the entire, you know, the food chain from the farmer on up, but also weigh uh, the actions we need to take because of climate change. And there are those who have a vision for, uh, something called a protein highway, a man named John Oliver out of Ontario, Canada. And um, he, he really believes that we can make these changes, but we have to have the will and we need to choose uh, the, the right crops that farmers can transition to with their current knowledge base or with very small modifications. Um, and he's proposing the development of, you know, for example, something called Carinata, uh, which is a, a mustard derivative and he he really believes that we can make these changes and he has he has seen decades um of the, the status quo so danielle were you going to add on i was uh but i i lost my train of thought um i was just i was thinking i think in canada as well at I had spoken to someone from the, the Good Food Institute about the transition to uh, lab-grown <laughs> proteins and lab-grown meats. And he had mentioned that there were some federal programs in Canada where they were helping farmers uh, transition to other forms of agriculture uh, so that they could still continue to earn income just in a, a new way. So it, it, it's, things will, probably adjust slowly, but we could see that there needs to be a transition at least, or at least options and support for farmers to adapt. I think that's probably the biggest takeaway. All right, and, and we're gonna bear down here on our last question, because I think that's about all we have time for at this point. And um, so this one I think is a fitting wrap up. What do you think is, this is from Anne, what do you think is one of the most, is, is one of the single biggest shifts that consumers can make in order to mitigate the effects of climate change? Eat a plant-based based diet. Agree. Do you, do you have any benchmarks? Like if, pe if completely plant-based is out of the question, what any, any suggestions for what the, what the, you know, like, you know, you know how they, ask people to do fish for you know suggest for health reasons anything any any sort of numeric what we, what we heard we can... is all right i was just gonna say remove one meat-based meal per week from your diet and that would make a huge difference i don't know what were you gonna add mike no it's just the approach we've taken is um you know treat and we're talking about red meat um as a delicacy I still love an occasional hamburger, but they're occasional. I, that's about the only red meat I consume. I'm, I'm allergic to most proteins, or most animal proteins, so I, I'm kind of lucked out by that, but um, I, I am, as Mike mentioned earlier, I love cheese, so that, <laughs> that came out in some of the writing. Um, <laughs> so. Evelyn, oh, go ahead, Danielle, are you done? I'm done, Sorry. yeah. Evelyn, Evelyn, I just want to come back to, I think the question focused on what we can do in our diet. Uh, but again, our message is not only, if we're using food to tell the larger message, to convey a larger message that we really need to change at a scale 
across industries, whatever it is, to minimize our greenhouse gas emissions in every way possible. And we're simply using food as a mechanism to convey that message. All right, well, thank you very much. Thank you. Yeah, so my, my thanks to all of our presenters for a wonderfully engaging talk and, and to everyone who was able to join us today. Uh, I think the link might have been posted in the chat a couple of times, but today's chat will be available in a few weeks on MAN's YouTube channel, and hopefully we can maybe post it in the chat one more time for everybody. Uh, and finally, there's there is one more book talk for this spring semester uh, hosted by the Fine Arts Library, and it features a book of photographs by Barry Perlis, Associate Professor Emeritus of Art in the College of Agri College of Architecture, excuse me, Art and Planning, as he discusses his photographic exploration of the Yantar Mantars in his book Celestial Mirror, the Astronomical Observ Observatories of Jai Singh the Second. And with that, I again thank all of our presenters and thank the audience for being here today. Have a wonderful evening, everybody. This is a production of Cornell University Library.